Essential oils, they're all the rage these days. More and more people are bypassing the pharmacy in favor of something else, essential oils made from plants. Yeah, but many are now swearing by the therapeutic health benefits from these plant-based oils. After trying a natural home remedy, one, by the way, that is surging in popularity lately. The truth is that oil has hundreds of compounds in it. And so if somebody asks you, what will that oil do? You can give them a quantum physics answer and say, what do you want it to do? because it's just a packet of possibilities. In 1999, I was introduced to these essential oils. Although I had uh, been interested in theology and read the Bible all my life, I really just read right over the parts of the Bible on oils I didn't even know that frankincense and myrrh were oils. When you get into quantum physics, you realize that our mind and our thoughts and our intentions are impugned upon physical matter. And we now know that your thoughts and intentions influence the effects of oils. And so quantum physics becomes a fundamental science in understanding how the oils work. In quantum physics, Light can be manifested as a continuous wave, or it can manifest as a stream of discrete particles called photons. Well, when we measure light as a, a series of particles, or we can measure it as a continuous wave, we know what it is at the time we measure it, but what was it on its way to where we picked it up? You know, like if a light starts over here and you pick it up over there, what is it in between? So they decided that light when it's in flight and it's on its way to either your eye or some other measuring device, it's neither, it's not even light. It's just a packet of probabilities. We have to look upon oils in the same manner. If somebody asks you, what will an oil do? You can say, well, that's uh, oregano and it's got phenylpropanoids in it and it does various things. And you can give them a chemical answer and that would be a good answer. But the truth is that oil has hundreds of compounds in it. And so if somebody asks you, what will that oil do? You can give them a quantum physics answer and say, what do you want it to do? Because it's just a packet of possibilities. And it's gonna manifest certain possibilities for you. It'll manifest different ones for me and different ones for somebody else. What decides what possibilities are manifest is your intention. And so out of that packet of possibilities, we make decisions on an unconscious or conscious level that pulls out of that oil certain things to happen. And that's why prayer works so well with the oils and why the oils work so well with prayer. What's absolutely fascinating is today you can understand how these oils do work on a molecular level. Um, and that's really where my fascinations come in. And what I'm trying to do today when I uh, travel the world and I teach about essential oils is really to take this information that is coming out by the day now. And because it's pretty complicated when you talk about epigenetics and transcription factors and how it changes the DNA and RNA and all that kind of stuff in your cells, to kind of take that and explain it in a language that everybody would understand. The essential oil basically what we get is a mixture of components. It's not a single organic compound. It has a mixture of components that imparts, in most cases, a pleasant aroma. Well, you know, I talk about the King's Medicine Cabinet and essential oils being superior to prescription drugs because they're all natural and they were created to work with our body. You know, prescription drugs are today the third leading killer in America. Literally, millions of people are dying from the side effects across the globe from medications. How do essential oils work? Because the oils are composed of very tiny molecules and because the membranes in our bodies are oily and because even our skin has got oils on it, they can penetrate skin. And once they're inside the body, they can travel through the lymphatic system, through the circulatory system. They can follow nerve pathways. You can put essential oils on the soles of your feet, like peppermint, something you can taste. And just wait a few minutes, and pretty soon you'll taste that peppermint on your tongue. Those oil molecules will have worked all the way up through your body. There's two basic kinds of oils 
There's the essential oils that are in a plant and they circulate in a plant right through cell walls and back out again and serve many life-preserving functions for the plants because of their mobility and ability to penetrate down to cellular levels and back again. So they bring nutrition and various kinds of information to the cells of the plant, carry waste products out. Plants also produce another kind of oil that's found only in their seeds. They're bigger molecules and they don't move. They stay in the seed and they will stay there through the life of the plant and never used by the plant. What they're used for is in the next generation when a plant seed begins to sprout, plants have to be able to make their own food and they can't do that until they have a root system and a stem system and through photosynthesis create sugars and starches and proteins that they need. And so there's a little gap in there when it first sprouts when it doesn't have any of those things. So the plant lives off of the oil in that seed until it can make its own food. So plants produce the seed oil for the next generation, not for themselves. And we press those oils out of the seeds and we call them vegetable oils. But those aren't the healing oils because they do not have the capability of penetrating your skin or passing the blood-brain barrier or addressing issues at a cellular level. The essential oils can do that. They can work like hormones and regulate your endocrine system. They can support your digestive system. They can support your nervous system. They're also very effective against bacteria and viruses. And the fact that they work at a cellular level is wonderful because that's really where all disease begins and that's where it has to be resolved. Molecular shapes and sizes of the molecules of essential oils are so compatible with our human body and that they fit the receptor sites on the cells so perfectly. And knowing that humans were not the first ones being created on this planet, plants came first and the oils came first. So to me, that means that these oils who fit us so well and were created before we were created, that God was thinking ahead and thinking of our well-being before he ever created us. So to me, that means God was already loving us before he made us. God never wastes an opportunity to use plants to promote the gospel. And so a, coi uh, a place where that's really evident is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And it says that, and this is God telling Noah to build an ark. And it says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood or cypress wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. So God didn't even waste an opportunity here to present the gospel just by using the plants that he gave us in the garden. Well, in the case of Mesopotamians, we see a lot of correlation between how they treat their patients and how the uh, worship was done. The same oil that's used to, to treat deceased people as well as to uh, anoint the gods, there are a certain correlation between that. But we see distinct preparations for treating the deceased as well as worshiping the god. Um, in the case of Egyptians, they have different concoctions, different preparations of uh, the scented oils. But in the case of Mesopotamians, we see a lot more in, in treating diseases fourth millennium BC, so that's 4000 BC. It's around the time where the Mesopotamians used these uh, scented oils that predate the early Egyptians to some extent. Well, you've seen Egyptian paintings and you see the ladies with coins on their head, thinking about that high, and I always thought that was hairdos. But actually those were cones of hippopotamus fat that had been saturated with myrrh. They didn't wear many clothes in Egypt because it was so hot. And so in the morning they would put those cones on their head and as the day, as the heat began to rise throughout the day, they would start to melt. And the myrrh is a sunscreen. Not only that, it's an insect repellent. So as the myrrh would come down over their bodies in the heat of the day, it would protect them from the sun and from the insects. There were actually myrrh in a fat for that purpose. So in the ancient times, different civilizations used different techniques. For example, among the Egyptians, they would lay the flowers or leaves on the fat and they expose it to sun. And during the daytime, the fats would melt and they will extract the components out of the, out of the plant material 
and then it will drip down in vases and they will collect the waste that contains the melted fat that has extracted all the causing compounds or the fragrant components of the plant material. It's called as expressing the, expressing the essential oils in a fat or even sometimes wines. In other cases, what they would do is they will take these fragrant materials, whatever, either it is a plants or shrubs or uh, leaves or flowers, they will take that, put it in a big pot along with water. They'll boil it and then they will filter the water out and they will have a essential oil water mixture. And they have used that also. So in the modern world, when it comes to distillation, we usually credit Avicenna as being the founder of modern distillation and rose oil being the first thing that he distilled. But when you take a look at modern archaeology, which is really cool, I love archaeological stuff, it teaches you all kinds of things about the world. There's a site in Pakistan where they found some distillation equipment that's pushing 5,000 years old. So whether they were actually separating the oil from the water, the hydrolot, I'm not sure. They could have been fragrant waters, you know, hydrosols that they were extracting. They could have been letting them set and then separating the oils. I'm not sure anybody knows that for sure, but distillation's been happening for the better part of five millennia. Most of the cases it might be tallow. Literature evidence suggests that people used uh, crocodile fat, since crocodile is pretty abundant in that region. They have also used beeswax. In fact, there are records on Egyptian hieroglyphs suggest us that uh, they have a standard beekeeping practice to get the beeswax. The main purpose of the beeswax is to extract the perfumes out of the plant material. And then the beeswax are made into a scented cones and the scented cones are placed on the top of kings and queens like in their head. And uh, during the daytime, in the heat of the desert, uh, what happens is that the cone would melt. It's, a, it's basically a wax material containing perfume. And the cone would melt and it would emit a fragrant odor to the surroundings. We had the Egyptians with Cleopatra. She's still known as having uh, had a beautiful skin and uh, having been a beautiful woman. Well, we know from the scriptures from the times that she used powderized frankincense and myrrh and that they mixed into paste and she used that in her face. I've been a professional model for 27 years and in an effort to try to prolong my career, I started using uh, anti-aging products. So if you go to pubmed.gov and you put in into that search en engine frankincense, balsam oil, or myrrh oil, you'll find that those three oils, those three tree resins from that region would cause apoptosis or cell death. Cell death to damaged skin cells. So you're going to find a bunch of uh, creams and uh, serums today that have both and um, frankincense and myrrh amongst other oils in it as ingredients to support the skin. So what that means is that if someone has wrinkles, someone has sun damage, someone has age spots, whatever's going on with the skin, those wrinkled or damaged cells can be killed off by these oils so that your body can then proliferate and create new healthy cells. Myrrh, for example, was used in the caravans. When you had liquids, they would spoil. I mean, the caravan will go three, four weeks through the hot sun. It was really blistering hot, so stuff would spoil. Well, if you added some myrrh in it, myrrh is a preservative. So as you use it as a preservative for food or liquids, you could use it as a preservative for your skin. Why are oils seemingly becoming more popular in today's time? People are discovering that the pharmaceuticals are not working. Uh, instead of making them well, they often make you more sick. You know, you end up overcoming this problem and acquiring a side effect which is maybe worse than your problem. Pharmaceuticals and medical practice in general is designed for relieving symptoms, not getting to the root cause of a disease. There were about 400 articles recently on essential oil and cancer. When you really drilled it down, at the end of the day, about 130 of those, roughly 130, described exactly what they have seen in genetic testing and all that, what these oils did on the cancer. They find out that essential oils actually address the roots. So we are at the verge of a new understanding what natural medicine does for the body and how we can compete or complement directly with what we do with prescription medicine. So in my search to find what oils would have been used in scripture, especially during pur purification, I had to go to Queen Esther. And um, in this verse it says that she was given six months with oil of myrrh 
and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. And so when I had to look into what were those other things, because we know oil of myrrh and we know how that would have been used for beautification and the purification of her skin. It's also very soothing for the skin. It's great for all types of skin issues. And so when you go to the Hebrew text in that, sweet odors and other things, um, one word that keeps coming up is balsam oil. Now, balsam oil is a tree res resin, and it's from that region, but it was also from the same climate and region as frankincense. So frankincense was also most likely used in those beauty regimens. Frankincense, myrrh, and then particularly balsam. So that's why these oils would have been used during this time period, and of course, that's exactly why I'm gonna be using those oils today. Well, the Bible, is not a book about oils. It's a book about God's relationship to the Israelites and the Hebrews and the early Christians. And the only reason oils are mentioned in there is because in that part of the world, in the Middle East there, what we call the Holy Land, for thousands of years, oils was an integral part of their life. They used them on a daily basis. They used them in their food. They even baked bread with frankincense. They were used in their rituals, in the synagogue and in the temple. It was just a, an everyday thing. Two of the best known essential oils are frankincense and myrrh. And the reason for that is because we read about them in the Bible. And so the old story goes that the three wise men brought baby Jesus precious metals and some essential oils. So the question is, why would someone bring not more gold or diamonds or precious stones that they had at the time. Why did they think that frankincense and myrrh were so precious that the most important baby ever born should get frankincense and myrrh? All of the gifts they brought Jesus, the frankincense, gold, and myrrh, were all very valuable. And in fact, the most valuable of those three was the frankincense, more valuable pound for pound than gold. When you really think about it, at the time, two, three thousand years ago, probably 30, 40, if not 50 percent of babies would die on childhood infections, early childhood infections. A lot of mothers would die after childbirth because they didn't have antibiotics. But the antibiotics of the time were frankincense and myrrh. We know today that uh, both frankincense and myrrh have excellent antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial properties. So one of the main reasons why you would give such a gift to a newborn baby was maybe to preserve the life of that baby. The three gifts looked after Jesus' physical well-being, his spiritual well-being, and even his financial well-being with the gold. So it was a complete gift for his whole life and for his family. Babies, newborn babies of kings and priests, would be anointed with frankincense. And so naturally, with the wise men coming from the east, and then they knew who Jesus was and who this child was and that he was to be a king of sorts. Naturally, he would need some frankincense to be anointed as a child. And the myrrh came because myrrh is a companion to frankincense. But myrrh is more than that. Oils were used for healing purposes. If you mixed myrrh with the frankincense, it would go a lot further. And so they could get four times as much healing out of frankincense if they mixed it with myrrh. So that's why the three wise men brought both of those oils together, because they were really meant to be used together. Myrrh has been a companion to many oils because of the property of supporting whatever they do and making it last longer and more effectively. Perfumers knew that if you put myrrh with your perfume, the scent would last a lot longer. Women of those days, and Mary knew this, anybody in her culture would know this, that if you would take myrrh and put it on your abdomen after a birth for six months to a year, they believed it would take stretch marks away. So when the wise men brought the frankincense to myrrh to Jesus and his family, they didn't explain what it was for because they didn't need to. Well, myrrh is the most mentioned oil of the Bible. It was given at his birth, but also it was given at the cross before he was crucified. They offered him myrrh in the wine that they offered him. And that was done because the Romans, they carried wine everywhere they went because there wasn't any safe drinking water. That was their drink. And so at the cross, it was customary for them to offer the victim 
a drink of wine which contained myrrh because they believed that if you put a little myrrh in the wine, you could drink more of it before you became drunk. And then in his burial, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to bury him and they brought a supply of myrrh to prepare his body for burial. In his life, there was a couple of times, three times actually, that he was anointed by a woman. The first time was early in his ministry, and it's in the book of Luke, where a uh, sinful woman from the city, it says, and he was at a Pharisee's house at the time, came with a bottle of spikenard and anointed his feet and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. But the ointment contained myrrh because myrrh was found in all of the ointments of the time. And in fact, the Greek word for ointment is myrrh, which is the Greek word also for myrrh. And the ointments of that day had that name of myrrh because myrrh was automatically added to all the ointments to extend the action of the other oils that were in there. So when in time you mix myrrh with another oil, it would make that oil's fragrance and therapeutic action last longer. Later on, in the house of Lazarus, in Mary, who was one of his disciples, six days before his crucifixion, she anointed his feet with myrrh, or rather with spikenard, which was myrrh, which was myrrh in the ointment. Now, this is up for debate by some researchers, but many researchers believe when you read spikenard in the Bible, they're referencing lavender or a very close cousin of lavender. And there's a, a, a scripture in the Bible that I love, and it's, it just really shows the amazing capacity of love and it's where Mary breaks a bottle of what they call a spikenard and she washes Jesus' feet with her hair. And here's the incredible thing. They said that bottle of lavender, that bottle of that nard was worth a year's wages. That's how valuable essential oils were in the Bible. I mean, they, they were worth as much as a year's income. We're talking about, I mean, today, you know, $10,000 for a bottle. That's how valuable these were. And then, Two days before he was crucified, he was in the house of Simon the leper. That's told in the book of Mark and the book of Matthew. And an unknown lady, they didn't name her, he, she came and anointed him on his head with the ointment, precious ointment of spikenard, which contained myrrh as well. So Jesus received myrrh several times in his life from birth and even after his death and even at the cross for many reasons. It was also one of the oils that you find in the holy anointing oil in the book of Exodus. It's also found in the holy incense described in the 30th chapter of the book of Exodus. Mar was a really fundamental oil of the Bible, the number one. There's an incident in the Old Testament, it's in the book of Numbers. A plague was sweeping through the Hebrews. Already 140,000 Hebrews had died so Moses told Aaron, he said, go up to the tabernacle and bring a censer. Now a censer is a either clay, ceramic, or metal container that's fireproof. He said, go up there to the altar of the tabernacle and get some fire, get some coals, and take incense. Now this was the holy incense, which was gabinum, anica, myrrh, and get that incense and put it in the censer and that heat source, the sensor was, had a, was a higher fireproof bottom part and then a shelf in there where they would put the oils and resins and then and that heat source would vaporize them. And you've probably seen this when Catholic ceremonies, that, that's a sensor. So Moses told him, go out among the people because a plague has begun. They referred to it as the wrath of God. He went out and actually went to all the tents. There was a, probably a half a million people out there in the desert. So it was Aaron and all of his sons and helpers, and they fumigated every tent. The people would stand in the vapors, as those vapors even touched their skin. It was going, the molecules, into their body. And the vapors was actually soaking into the walls of the tents, sanitizing everything. The plague stopped right then and there. There were no more any deaths after that. Up until World War II, you had practices of fumigation. And so people in medical wards and churches, anytime there were outbreaks, people were burning herbs. You had, you know, incense, essentially, fumigation. They were burning things for the smoke. And the smoke had disinfectant properties, antimicrobial properties. And you can do that now with essential oil extracts as opposed to fumigating within a hospital. And I think there's tremendous potential in buildings, not just hospitals, but any kind of building, because not only are they antimicrobial, but you feel better, it elevates your mood to help moderate people's energy levels. If you look at the origins of the oils that were used in the biblical 
part of the world where the Old and the New Testaments took place, you will find out that most of the oils they used came from plants that don't grow in that part of the world. But the reason they had access to them is because if you're a trader and you're coming from the Far East and you want to go to Africa, or if you're in Africa and you want to go to Europe, or in Europe and you want to go to Africa, you have to go through there. That's the only way, unless you cross the Mediterranean. So all the caravans of the world went through the Holy Land, and so all of the oils being traded came through there. And so they had access to oils like sandalwood, which came from India, spikenard, which came from Tibet, Annika, which was part of the holy incense, which actually came from Indonesia. Even frankincense and myrrh don't come from the Holy Land. And they just use them, but they didn't grow there. I talk to people about the importance of the spice trade because I like to eat. What's my food flavored with? Spices. You know, I like medicine. What are they built from? What are they made from? What are they extracted from? Spices. You know, every chemical company on the planet is extracting molecules and, and things that come out of herbs and spices and things like that. And so I ask people, we live in America. Why was America, how did America get founded? Why was it founded? Why did Christopher Columbus set sail? Because he was looking for a shorter route to India for the spice trade. The United States literally exists because of the spice trade. And things, they may not have been using and, and extracting essential oils like we know them today, but they would have been used in incense, they were compounding things, there were ways of extracting the materials, uh, and the spice trade was vibrant back then, and it is today, and everyone in the Western Hemisphere, you know, in the New World exists because of the spice trade. What we want to talk about now is the different ways on how you can apply, use the essential oils, and of course the original ways to do aromatherapy that has been done for thousands of years. The problem comes, can you ingest oils? When you go to aromatherapy school, they will tell you never ever consume, internalize an essential oil because it could be life-threatening. Well, so watch my suicide right now uh, in front of the camera. Oh, there's just about three or four drops. Look, I completely understand the line of thinking because there are essential oils you should never internalize. However, what that line of thinking should also understand is when you just stay with aromatherapy alone, you're missing out on so much of the world that the essential oils can give us. I hear people that are really very, very aggressively defending the statement you should never eat or consume an essential oil because it's dangerous to your life. Guess what? Those people go the same day, they go to the grocery store, they buy food, they buy beverages, they eat it, they drink it, and they're still alive. Why? Because all these foods, all these beverages, all the flavors are essential oils. So the FDA has an entire article that talks about the oils that they have approved, essential oils, for flavoring of food and beverages. Unfortunately, these are typically not natural, pure essential oils. They're synthetics because the food and beverage companies are trying to save money. But if you think that you never ever consume an essential oil, you need to rethink your life because you're eating and drinking them every single day. And you can go, let's say, in France, and you go to the pharmacy and say, I will kind of cold, I have a little cough, I need something. And they, they will ask you and say, do you want a pill, a medicine, or you want something natural? So I'll say, I want something natural. They say, do you want an essential oil? I say, cool, I want an essential oil. And they say, how do you want it? I have capsules here, I have capsules there. And you can buy entire boxes with pre-filled capsules with essential oils and you can consume them. So they are used in the culture and they're still doing very well. So now from the FDA point of view, there is a different kind of topic that you need to look at. And it's called labeling. So if you label something as a cosmetic act oil, meaning an aromatic, you're not allowed to ingest it. If it's part of a supplement, then you can ingest it. I use oils to improve athletic performance, exercise performance. So I use that with professionals, with athletes, but as well with people like me that just want to improve the exercise. When you take peppermint and you, you, you rub it on your muscles and you inhale it, ah, you're getting more air. Well, the reason for that is you, you're opening your small airways in your lungs. So therefore you're getting more oxygen and the oxygen will go into your blood and now you have more oxygen delivery to your muscles. 
So that will lead to a longer muscle contraction before you reach what we call a lactic threshold. The lactic threshold is when you don't have enough oxygen and you can produce energy with your muscles, the muscle will start using a pathway that does not use oxygen. We call this anaerobic pathway, and it will create lactic acid. So when you build up a lot of lactic acid in your muscle, then the muscle will quit working. So how easy it is just to use a little bit of peppermint and the lactic threshold goes up. And so I use this for my workout. I use this with athletes. I use peppermint. I use other oils. I use oils that already prevent the soreness of the muscle when I'm done with the workout. I can work out better. I can work out longer. You take one drop of peppermint in a glass of water just before you work out. Your grip strength will increase by 34%. Your vertical jumping will increase 7% and your long jumping just out of your standing will increase 6%. Why is that? Because you just got more oxygen in your muscle. So I use peppermint, not just rub it on my muscle and inhale it, I also put one or two drops in my drink. And so I increase my workout performance. Once you have a safe oil to ingest in your hand, how would you ingest it? Well, I demonstrated you one way to do that. It's just kind of drop it in your, under your tongue or on your tongue. Another way to do that is to take a glass of water and then you drop a few drops here and then you just start drinking. Mm. Now another way to do that is to take little capsules. This is a little capsule maker just to put the capsule in there. And just to show you how that works, these are vegetable capsules, they're empty. Now don't try with water because water will dissolve it. So, but you can use any kind of oil, coconut oil, whatever, or an essential oil. And the way you would do that, you would open that capsule and you would take your oil and then you just kind of fill it up. And now you see, hopefully, so here I just filled the whole capsule. So I'm gonna cap that back together, dunk. Voila, I have my essential oil capsule. What do I do with this? I take my essential oil infused water and I'm healthy. There is a whole list in the FDA which one are approved, one not. And if your company that sells you your essential oil is very smart, they will go to the energy and to the costs and the lawyers and the collaboration with the FDA to label them so that you as a consumer, you know which one you can consume internally and which one not. And again, I absolutely agree with the aromatherapy school with that line of thinking. They are very on the careful side. That's always good to be. There are some essential oil you should never ingest. They have um, certain things in it that your body will not tolerate very well. And then the last question is, what dose can you ingest? If you do a few drops of each oil, that will be fine. Have you watched a movie commercial on a drug? So you're sitting there and you're seeing a grandma playing with the children, somebody helping building a house for someone who lost a house. There's a voice in the back that will tell you, oh, you will die because your liver go fail and you will die the most terrible death you've ever seen. But all you'll see is the wonderful mother with the children and the flowers, and you don't listen to that voice anymore. So when you take the essential oil in comparison to that one drug, because now you're giving this mega dose of this drug, of course you have all these side effects. But when you take the oil, you have all this balance. And so your safety margin is just absolutely amazing. It's just humongous. If it's done in a reasonable amount, it's very, very safe. You can read a lot of books out there that forbid any internal use of oil. They say it's dangerous, you should never take them internally. And then you read another book that says it's okay. But here's the source of that contradiction. There are several schools of thought and schools of practice with use of oils. The German school of thinking is that the best way to take the oils is to inhale them. And that's a good idea because when you inhale them, not only do they go to the limbic brain where you can deal with emotional issues, but they go into your lungs and into your bloodstream and they reach every organ and cell in your body that way. And then you have the British school, which thinks that oils are intrinsically dangerous. They don't recognize any healing properties of the oils and they basically recommend diluting essential oils down to no more than two to five percent and then use it for massage. And they also believe that it's dangerous to take oils internally and they don't even think an undiluted oil should be put on your skin. Well partly that has to do with they don't have good oils. Most oils out there that you will buy that have a label on them that says an essential oil are maybe only partly essential oil. They have other things in them that would be toxic and would be dangerous and should not be taken internally. 
the British are not careful about what kind of oil they use, so they're using inferior grade oils, and they, for that reason, they have to be careful. And that's where all of those fears and cautions come from. So when you see these contradictions, just realize they're in a different world. And all the dangers they talk about, they're not there for what we use. But then there's another school of thought, and that's the French school, is that oils are pretty safe to use any way you want to use them, provided they are pure, organic, properly distilled oils. So in the French school, they take them orally, they take them directly on the skin, they take them by holding them in, in the mouth, they will soak right through the lining of your mouth and go straight to the bloodstream that way. But you have to use common sense. You don't want to drink a whole bottle of any oil. Uh, too much of anything, even a good thing, can be deadly. So as long as you don't overdo it, it's safe to take a pure therapeutic grade oil. Why are oils seemingly becoming more popular in today's time? And I've noticed a great increase in the interest in oils just in the last 15 years that I've been acquainted with them. A couple of reasons for that. People are discovering that the pharmaceuticals are not working. Instead of making them well, they often make you more sick. You know, you end up overcoming this problem and acquiring a side effect, which is maybe worse than your problem. They're beginning to wake up to the fact that pharmaceuticals and medical practice in general is designed for relieving symptoms, not getting to the root cause of a disease. So you just simply get rid of one set of symptoms and you have another because you really didn't address the problem. And so they find out that essential oils actually address the roots. Most of the diseases that we have have emotional and spiritual roots. They're not physical. And if you treat only the physical side of things and you still retain the emotional unresolved problems, then you may resolve one illness and just get another. We have five senses. Four of those senses process through the cerebrum up here, which is your conscious rational mind. But the nose does not. The nose circumvents this part of the brain, goes under that, into an area called the limbic brain. It's the emotional brain, it's not rational. And fragrance goes straight to that part of the brain. But that is the part of the brain that is the librarian and cataloger of all of our unresolved emotions. So if you have a traumatic experience as a child or any time in your life that you don't have the maturity and understanding to process, then that emotion is stored in your body. Those experiences have to be resolved. If we can't resolve them at the time, then the limbic brain says, okay, we're gonna save that for later and it'll put it somewhere in your body. Let's say that puts it in your pancreas. Let's say that's a good place. We can put that particular experience there. 10 years later, you don't even remember it. It'll start malfunctioning as a pancreatic malfunction. Now the medical people are gonna say that's just a physical problem and they will treat the physical idea, but that doesn't deal with the root. And let's say you don't get it and after a little bit of hypoglycemia or some problems in that regard, that's your pancreas trying to tell you there's an issue, it's here. If you will work and call it up and deal with it, it'll go away. But you don't get it and you're not taught that in normal health classes or books on medicine. So when you use the word allergy, it's really funny. And the reason is, is that when you use the word allergy, it's to a protein. There aren't any proteins in an essential oil. It's a volatile compound extract. And so there are no true allergies to essential oils. What you can have is a chemical sensitivity. And there are a few things to think about here. The first off is that when somebody has a chemical sensitivity, it can be a genuine sensitivity, some kind of molecule that they might be highly sensitive to. The other thing to think about is that no one really goes from zero to 60. People are usually driving at 59. The needle doesn't break the camel's back. It's every preceding needle that leads up to that one needle being too much. So the thing to keep in mind here is that there aren't 
allergies to essential oils. There are no proteins in the compounds that are being extracted from the plants. So when I have patients come in and they talk about allergies that they might have to fragrance, I also have a, a perfume company, and so I hear this commonly as well. People have allergies to fragrance. And so when I treat patients, what they're usually getting is some kind of heat or skin rash. Again, it's a chemical sensitivity that they're getting. And because no one goes from zero to 60, people are driving usually at 59 when they touch something, and that's what pushes them over. I would advise patients or the people that I run into to get treated. Go see some acupuncture. Of course, it's not the only modality that you have to go to, but I have a lot of great success in treating patients. And I find that people no longer react to the things that they were reacting to. Well, the oils go straight to the limbic brain. You can bring that forgotten memory back to consciousness, and then you can deal with it because it's back in the conscious mind. That's one of the wonderful and unique ways that oils can bring about healing that pharmaceuticals can't do because they're designed to mask up symptoms so that you think you're well when you're really not. I went back to the research and the science and said, so what else do these oils do on my brain? And I found a bunch of research showing that essential oils will change the brain waves. We can change the way your brain waves work. For example, you go to a, a spa. What kind of scent are you likely to smell when you go to a spa for a massage? It's typically lavender. So why would a spa put up lavender in the air? Well, because they don't want you to be on six blackberries or seven blackberries on a new iPad while the massage therapist try to massage you. And you're supposed to be relaxed. Lavender will slow down your brain waves and will put you almost in the first stages of sleep. So lavender is an excellent oil to put in your bedroom. You're going to slow down your brain waves. We're looking at four main brain waves. We're looking at what we call beta. Beta waves are when you're really active. So right now I'm in beta. Then you can go down to alpha. Alpha is when I close my eyes right now and I start concentrating I'm still awake. This is a stage where I become very creative. A lot of artists, they will paint, they will write. Let's say you have a basketball player and he wants us to shoot a basket and there's all that noise around him. Something that distinguishes a very good basketball player is that you can measure that he can have a burst of alpha waves. That means he can completely concentrate on the basket and zoom out all that noise. And that will distinguish a very good basketball player from maybe not as good a basketball player. So we can do this with oils. We know, for example, that sandalwood, the frankincense, the peppermints, they will be more the alpha and the beta. However, when you go into the lavender, the bergamot, uh, the cedar woods, they will slow you down. You go to, to beta, uh, for alpha, and then you go to theta and delta. These are all the waves that we have in the brain. These are the waves that you use while you sleep. Knowing all that, I can use essential oils for, to treat people with insomnia or to help them just fall asleep, or babies that cried. So it's just fascinating again how you see the science and then the effect it has on the patients. Yes, hello everybody. This is Doc Ali and here is Becky. Becky, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? I am Becky Basham, neurofeedback practitioner and brain fitness coach. Okay, so what Becky does is basically in brain mapping, real-time brain mapping. We're going to provide you with live images on that screen that you see. You're going to see exactly what happens with my brain. I have a brain cap on. We're going to measure all my brain waves, and we're going to see into the brain, and we're going to smell some essential oils. Each one of those squares on the picture represents a five-millimeter voxel of electrical information. Those are your brain waves. Yeah. They're measured in cycles per second or how many times they go up and down in a second. And the computer takes all this information, breaks it down into component bands, different frequencies, and tells us how much of each different speed. We've got different speeds of brain waves. Delta is slower. Theta is a little bit slow, as in zero to four cycles per second or hertz. And we've got theta alpha, beta, and this is the front part of your brain here. This is the top of the head. And then if we turn here, this is the back. Each one of these green dots represents one of the electrodes on your head. 
Theta is often, that's the brainwave that's associated with meditation. That's right. Alpha is a nice idle frequency. And once you, like you said, with athletes. What we're going to do now, we're going to, as soon as you're ready, you're going to tell me. And then I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you what oil I'm sniffing. And then we're going to see what happens to the brain overall. And we're going to dig into different parts of the brain, like the limbic system, the frontal lobe, the back lobe, the occipital lobe, temporal lobes. And going to see what the oils do to these parts of the brain. Now, what what oil are you going to start with? So the first one I'm going to use is peppermint. If I'm going to use peppermint oil, I would use it to to help me to focus and concentrate, right? That's right. So, and when do we normally need to focus and concentrate? Is when we're going too slow, like brain fog. So let me take this and window it to that theta. Now, this here in the front. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain that's in charge of focus and attention. I'm smelling peppermint now. So you've got, oh, now this is really interesting, Dr. Ali. The left side of the brain typically is associated with positive emotions and the right side of the brain with negative emotions. The left side of the brain is analytical the right side of the brain is big picture and which one are we activating here so the left side of your brain is looking like it has more beta than the right side of the brain which means i'm positive positive makes me active analytical and positive interesting that's very interesting so again i'm going to say this very loud peppermint has made me positive and activated my focus and my analytical thinking now I'm going to switch the oil and let's just stay on this one because we don't want to mess around too much around with the different frequency. Let's go back to the whole brain and I'm going to grab an oil, lavender. So right now I'm taking lavender. I'm going to start breathing on the lavender. Now lavender is typically associated with a calming effect, isn't it, Dr. That is Ali? That is correct. So let's see if in, if our theory holds, then the level of beta activity will decrease when you use the lavender. Is that correct? That is correct. And I think that's exactly what we see, right? It appears that way. It's becoming less red. So my frontal brain becomes slower. Now let's look at this in, uh, let's see what it does with the limbic lobes. Limbic lobes are usually associated with emotions, memories. See that red spot in the front there? That part of the brain is known as the anterior cingulate gyrus. This part here would be the left posterior cingulate gyrus. And and these these are places of the limbic lobes that are in charge of of where the brain is going to focus attention. The anterior cingulate, as Dr. Daniel Amen would describe, he says is like the gear shifter of the brain, determines what part of the brain. Uh, This time I take a lemon and just stay on that measurement. Okay. And I'm going to see if lemon can activate the limbic system. So these are your temporal lobes. Uh huh. So I'm still let's, doing lemon, and we're looking at temporal lobes. Let's see what you can do to activate your temporal lobes, Dr. Ollie. Oh, we see that already. Looks like with lemon, I'm activating my ability to listen. Now I'm going to make something interesting. I'm going to mix lemon and peppermint to activating oils. Look at that. It's, it's mainly on the left side, too. Interesting, but we see clearly an increase in activity while I'm sniffing on lemon and peppermint. So let's finish that up. I'm taking away the peppermint and the lemon right now, and we're going to go and do something else. I'm going to open frankincense. We're going to see what frankincense does to my brain. Now, let's see what I would expect with frankincense. With frankincense, I would expect a relaxation of the brain, and I would expect possibly an activation on the limbic system. It will slow down my limbic system. I would add, so I'm starting sniffing 
frankincense right now. And typically this is a problem when people may be in the classroom or on the job, just paying attention to too many things and they're all over the place. So See, temple that, lobes. Look at that. The other side that was very red before is now calmed down. Yeah, it was actually a little bit too red. Now, granted, when you started smelling that, your, your brain was in a nice attention, right. good place. So it's very important, I would think, to be careful about which oils you choose. They are powerful, and you want to make sure that you select the the one yeah. that's going to be best for you at the moment. So clearly frankincense has slowed down my left temporal lobe. Let's go into the limbic system at this point. Okay. And at this point, I would suggest we go to a lower brain wave because I think the frankincense is supposed to slow down, especially receptors in the limbic system. Well, look at alpha. So alpha seems to be very slow also in the limbic system right now. Actually, alpha right now, the alpha is in a good place. Oh, it's in a good green. Place because, it's, yes, yeah. it's in a good place. Okay. Yeah. If it's if you don't have enough alpha, it's going to be on the blue side. If you have too much going, then it's going to be on the red side. Which tells me that frankincense brings me in a very good creative stage right now. It's very nice. Your limbic lobes are happy. Yeah, my limbic system is very happy with frankincense, which makes sense because we know we have receptors in the limbic system for frankincense. Oh, interesting. If you look. I just opened my eyes. Okay. Close your eyes again. I'm going to describe what happens. Turn this around. So your brain is making a normal range of theta activity for somebody your age and gender. We're in a normative reference database here. But what I'm going to do here, just stay right where you are. I'm going to show everybody your raw brain waves. And what this means here, see as eyes are closed, see these brain waves here that are bigger and more sinusoidal they're they're like bigger and wider so those ones are slower and they're located in the posterior part of it there's one right there nice nice alpha burst in the potemporal posterior temporal lobes this is what we want to see when people close their eyes and they're in a nice meditative state if people are really stressed out and hyper vigilant we're not going to see that. We're going to see those brain waves continue to go really fast. It's always nice to see that science uh, works together with what you think the oil would do. And you're, it's clear for me to say that the oils do really support healthy brain function. Um, we saw that pretty nicely, both on the speeding up side and on the calming side. <laughs>and that part of the ear where my finger is, is where you would release issues with your mother and father. This one is most interesting because there's where you relieve blockages against learning new material. And then the right big toe is to release bad habits and compulsive behavior. But the thumb was the one that interested me, me the most because I teach course in chemistry. There are many people out there who are very good in music, they're good in social studies, can learn almost anything, but they have a block on one subject like physics or math, chemistry. Why would you be good at everything but one field? Well, it's because on that particular field, you have an emotional block against that subject. It's not your IQ. And we can get rid of that block and open the way for you to learn that subject. So when I teach my chemistry class, I always ask 
Everybody raise your hand who has no problem learning other subjects, but you have a problem with chemistry. Half a dozen hands go up, yeah, I never could learn it. I said, well, we're going to take care of that right now. So we take cedarwood oil and put it on the right thumb. And I said, now, that needs to get to the limbic brain. Your limbic brain is right over the roof of your mouth and below the cerebrum, so let's take your thumb, put it in your mouth, suck on your thumb, push it up there to the roof of your mouth. So the whole class is sitting there sucking their thumbs. And before it's over with, the people that couldn't learn chemistry, they can learn it. It gets rid of that blockage. Many people that couldn't even learn chemistry that I have taught are now teachers of chemistry. And it always goes back to a traumatic experience in their childhood, usually in a classroom with a science or math teacher who intimidated the students, embarrassed them, and humiliated them in front of everybody else. You know, stand up and recite these things and they couldn't do it, or go to the board and, and they just stood there, couldn't do it, and they were so embarrassed that they put a block right there on that subject. So the very thing the teacher was trying to do to teach them, they were blocking. So organizations like the FDA came out of a large problem with non-trained people or professionals, however you want to call them, selling products and claiming that they had medical value and they may or may not have had medical value or potency or the function that they were claiming to have. So when somebody uses the term snake oil today, what they're usually trying to say, a lot of times you hear the phrase quack medicine. And they're trying to say, oh, it's quack medicine. I hear this about Chinese medicine too. And the thing is, is that more than half the world's population uses this as primary health care. Doesn't mean that half the world's population are idiots. It's just a different science. So when you step back 150 years and you take a look at what was happening in the United States, first off, there weren't 50 states. The United States doesn't look like it did today. People didn't have the capacity to communicate over large distances of of time and space in a very quick manner. And so there was a need for the government to step in and try to regulate some of the things that were being claimed. As the railroads were being built, the Irish were being hired on the East Coast and the Chinese on the West Coast. And with the Chinese came their medicine and all of their medical practitioners. And actually, snakes are used as medicinal substances. There are snake oils that are made from snake. The railroads really like the Chinese because compared to the Irish, they were in fantastic health. The Irish didn't have the medical practitioners of the knowledge and they weren't taking care of themselves quite as well as the Chinese were. And so the Chinese had a great work ethic and they didn't get as sick and they lasted a lot longer. Fewer than 50% of doctors would have been trained, formally trained, and actually have gone to a medical school. Most people around the world up until recently, in, until after World War II, would have been trained from an apprenticeship. And so you worked in a doctor's office and that's how you learn the medicine. You have another definition of a snake oil in that as people were out west, people got bit by snakes. I lived out in California for five years and there's a whole bunch of poisonous snakes that just wander up into your house sometimes or onto your back porch. And so if you lived out west before there were people, I can imagine that there might have been some run-ins with snakes and a lot of them are poisonous. And so you had lots of antidotes and things like that that were people making for snake bites. And they may or may not have been effective. And again, that needs to be regulated for those snake oils. Something that people don't talk about is there's actually an herb that comes out of Canada and northeastern United States, and in its common name, it's called snake root. And snake root is also extracted as an essential oil, and it's a species of wild ginger. And there are actually, again, pharmacy tradition using essential oils as medicine and tinctures and other types of extracts. A lot of these extracts would have been fragrant, you know, again, going back into volatile compounds, essential oils. But the snake root oil, again, snake root being the common name, was used in a wide variety of pharmacy compounding, you know, things that people were buying. The primary purpose of the FDA in general is, is public health and safety. So the, that's the first thing they are looking for in a, any product they regulate is, is it safe for consumer use? For the FDA to approve things, they need to have scientific proof. So in order to get scientific proof, we need to do studies. In order to do large studies, we need money. It will cost a lot of money. 
Who is paying normally the money to do large studies? It's the pharmaceutical industry because they want to make money with their new drugs. They hope to, have to find a new blockbuster you know, for billion dollar uh, sales a year, like the statins are. So they will invest a lot of money in drug development, but they will probably not invest anything in essential oil because there's really no patents you can fill on that. So there's really no sales for them to do with these kind of drugs. It's really simple. It really goes back to money. You know, when you look at the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, so many of those people are really tied together. And really, the fact is it really comes down to money, and that's, that's really the only reason. Although more and more pharmaceutical companies start going into the supplement market because it's an enormous market. I mean, when you look at about 60 to 80 percent of the population is taking one or more supplements, right? So it's a tricky question. The FDA is charged to keep the public safe. For the last 15 years, I was heavily involved in drug development. What we do, we ask someone to bring back a plant from the jungle, flowers, trees, any plant. And then we give this to the chemists and we say, look, can you analyze this plant for me? But at the end of the day, you get a readout of the components that you find in the plants. You don't always know what these components are, but you see curves with a whole bunch of different peaks. And then suddenly you see a huge peak and then again, small peaks. And we came kind of to the conclusion, probably wrongly so, that if you see a huge peak of something in a plant, that that's an active substance. Now that's uh, sometimes a very dangerous assumption because sometimes these little small peaks are as important or more important. So you're getting a readout, and then you tell the chemist, look, I see a big peak, why don't you go back in the laboratory and recreate that synthetically for me? So the next day he goes in the laboratory, starts cooking, and comes back with a substance. Then you look at that and say, well, pretty cool. So now you start doing cell line studies. You put, let's say, in cancer research, we, we take very well-known cancer cells, and we mix them together with these substances uh, that we just synthesized. And then we see whether it inhibits cancer growth or not. If it does, then we move on to what we call in vivo studies, where we take some animals with well-known uh, cancer models, and then we look at, is it able to basically save that animal or not, or decrease the tumor growth? And then we can move into a human trial. So what we just created is a drug that is made out of a huge peak, only one substance, whereas in the plant that we gave in the first place to analyze, we had maybe up to 2,000 maybe only 500, maybe 3,000 compounds. So we took one out of them, we now synthesize it so we can give an enormous dose of it, and it will just do one thing typically because it's one compound. They will have side effects, why? Because you're giving an unnaturally high dose of a single thing to a patient that is not natural. Whereas if I could go back to the plant where we started in the first place, I would have something that is very well balanced and I could give that to the patient. The same substance is in there, but it's natural. And because we have 2,000 compounds in it, you know, or more, we're going to see multiple effects. We're going to not only treat symptoms, we may even treat the cause. And that's, you know, the light I had to go on in my head is, oh my God, this is the same thing I was doing in drug development, but it's the pure form, it's the natural form, it's the complete form. Now, what I'm saying is very, very difficult to say in a sense because the FDA has approved the essential oils as food supplements or cosmetic supplements. And the FDA has not approved essential oils as treatment modalities, certainly not to internalize. And you and I, we are consuming essential oils on a daily basis. We just don't know it. They're in all the food flavorings. This is what essential oils are being used mostly for food flavoring. Right? or for cosmetics. So we know that they saved, they have a safe history of thousands of years. The FDA is not interested in anything unless it can be classified as a drug. Drugs generally in their mind are man-made substances, they're not natural. They are really controlled by the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceuticals are not interested in anything that doesn't make them a profit. And to make a profit, they need to have something that they can uniquely own and patent, like a drug that's not natural, it's man-made, and it's unique. And so a non-patentable medicine is of no interest to the pharmaceuticals, and the Food and Drug Administration is not interested either. But if you have something that's supposed to be an effective drug, they want to see a toxicity study. That means that you have to get a, a set of lab animals and you start giving doses 
of your stuff to the animal population and you keep increasing it until half of the population dies. It's called the lethal dose that 50% of your animals die. It's called the LD50 number. Well, if you have something that's natural and it's not toxic and you cannot find a lethal dose, they will not accept that. In their philosophy, no medicine can be effective unless it's toxic. I do realize there's still a lot of confusion about compliance. And in general, you can say you are trying to sell a product or you're trying to sign up a new distributor. Automatically, that is called commercial speech because you're trying to do something commercially. You're trying to sell something or to make money of it in one way or the other. Commercial speech has its own rules. And there's two agencies that will look at that. The FDA would look at the health claims that you make. And then the FTC, so the FDA stands for Food and Drug Administration. And the FTC, which stands for the Federal Trade Commission, will look at on how do you use your marketing claims to try to sell something. I frequently talk about living above the line. We have a big red line. Everything above the line is wellness, fitness, healthy living, toxin-free living. It's anything you can do to support your own lifestyle, to make a healthy lifestyle. So as long as you talk about these things that are above the line, you're going to be fine. The moment you go below the line, it means you're talking about disease, about prevention, about treating, about curing. All that's a no-no. It's all about two words. It's intended use and another word called labeling or the label, okay? So what is intended use? Well, if I take a peppermint and say, I'm gonna use the peppermint for asthma. The intended use is to use it as a medicine against asthma. That's illegal, it's a no-no. But when I say I use peppermint to support my healthy breathing, that's a different story. Now you're above the line, you health, wellness, fitness, and you just try to improve your life. Of your life. Now, label is a little more difficult to understand. People always think the label is just what's on the bottle, right? There's always a little label that sticks to the bottle. Whatever product you buy has a label. And I always try to get people to read labels and learn to, how to read labels. So they always think, well, if we talk about essential oil, it's the label on the bottle of the essential oil that we're talking about. No. From the FDA and FTC point of view, the label means everything that talks about the product, mentions the products, or shows the product. Meaning, your website, your Facebook page, your email even, that mentions a product, whatever it is. So you have to be really, really careful what you say, because it's all considered a label. So when it comes to essential oils, the essential oil company will go, in this case to the FDA, because it's kind of health products, and they will say, okay, we intend to use peppermint for this. The this could be aromatic use, in other words, you do aromatherapy or you smell it. It could be topical use, so you put it somewhere, or it could be internal use. We know, look, the FDA knows there's like 15,000 studies on essential oils, so they can read. I mean, so why cannot they cannot read all these research studies that we have? Well, they can and they do. But it's not up to them to tell it because there's 10 studies on peppermint showing this, that now every company can claim that. It's up to the company to go to the FDA and say, look, we used our oil to do this study, and we did multiple, and it always showed the same result. Therefore, we want you to approve it for this use. Do we want that? Do you want for every oil that you consume today to go to a physician to get a prescription or to only be able to buy this in the pharmacy? I don't think so. So this is why the company, they stay with the Cosmetic Act or with the Dietary Act. They don't go to the over-the-counter or the Professional Prescription Medicine Act. All over the world, when you look at essential oils, with the exception of the U.S., in 99% of the countries, they are registered as cosmetics only. So that restricts the uh, claims you can make around the world even more than what you can do in the U.S. So some people think, oh my God, the FDA is so terrible. Well, go somewhere else in the world. The FDA is way more liberal than other places around the world, interestingly. And one thing that you don't see happening in modern Western science is once something has been shown, no one is going back and retesting the theories. And it's one of the reasons why when you see a pharmaceutical being released out into the public, 10 years later it's taken off the market. Because now what do you have? You have a real world experiment. 
you have multitudes of people taking this in a variety of different situations that they exist in, and then you see, does it work the way that they think it works? Is it effective? Is it harming people? What kinds of, side effect is really the wrong word. It's more like, what kinds of unexpected actions does it have? Side effect sounds more negative than I think what the reality of it is. And as you look at these things, again, over a span of time, that's what real science is. Clinical science, I think, is the really effective science because you can show anything that happened an isolated incident in a lab with a small group of people. But take it out into the world and you have thousands, millions of people using this and there's not a control. All of their lives are different, their diets are different, their habits are different. That's when you really see how something behaves within a population. How many people over at least 2,200 years of written history, and even the oldest texts reference that this stuff is older than the writing, and on top of that you have archaeological evidence that shows that this goes back several millennia. So there's no dispute that it's old. And I have trouble believing in a world where everything could potentially be life or death, that people would continue propagating something that doesn't work. You know, why would people do something over and over again if it doesn't actually work? And why would large masses of people over a very large geographical space over several millennia of time keep doing something if it doesn't work? I mean, I don't know how more science that gets. Let me explain what a cell does during the day. How does the cell know what to do? We have a DNA, it's a spiral. We'll call it a helix. This DNA is part of your genetic code. This is how you look like you look, how I look like I look. That's determining your genes. So in order for the cells to look at your genes, what happens multiple times a day or multiple times even a second, that DNA has to open up. And now you have two strands of DNA that are now coming apart. And these two strands are being copied. That copy is called an RNA. That copy will go into the cell. I mean, all that happens in the cell, in the nucleus of the cell. I say the most, you know, one of the most important parts of the cell. And the helix goes back together. So now we have a copy out there, and that copy will tell basically in what sequence you have to bring in certain amino acids to put together, to build together some blocks. It's like building Lego. And depending on what the RNA says, it's a different sequence. Depending on the sequence of the amino acid, you get different proteins or different hormones. This is how your body knows what to do. It's all built on this whole kind of process. The big question now becomes, how does the cell know this DNA is that long? How does it know to start reading here to here, not here to here? And we call these kind of pieces that will determine where you start reading this DNA transcription factors. They will go in there and determine you're gonna start reading here and stop reading here. We know that certain foods, ingredients in the foods, act as transcription factors. Essential oils, we know, act as transcription factors. So the essential oil will tell your DNA where to start reading, where to stop reading. And that will determine what kind of proteins the cell will produce. The truth is that oil has hundreds of compounds in it. And so if somebody asks you, what will that oil do, you can give them a quantum physics answer and say, what do you want it to do? Because it's just a packet of possibilities. And it's gonna manifest certain possibilities for you. It'll manifest different ones for me and different ones for somebody else. And so what decides what possibilities are manifest is your intention, the intention of the people or the person anointing you. And so out of that packet of possibilities, we make decisions on an unconscious or conscious level that pulls out of that oil certain things to happen. So we're wedded to the sciences and to the spiritual world through quantum physics.